is uh, something that I've been working on probably for about the last three years. And I've given a couple of presentations on the Civil War in Montana. And this one I did last summer up at the Great Falls Public Library. And essentially what it is, is it's a series of vignettes of items from the collection that talk about the Civil War in some shape, way, or form. Um, and uh, when I was asked to start looking into the Civil War and the creation of Montana Territory and so forth, I wasn't really sure what I would find. You know, usually when we think about the territorial period, we think about the vigilantes, we think a little bit about Sidney Edgerton, and then we, you know, we jump up into the Capitol fight and so forth like that. You know, there's not a lot of meat and potatoes um, into the rest of it. So I was pleasantly surprised to discover that the American Civil War, as we would have assumed, um, was all-encompassing, even out here. Uh, you literally could not escape the war. Uh, no matter how far west you went. And uh, that's exactly what some folks were doing. Um, they were attempting to escape the war. A lot of the early residents um, to come to the territory before Montana was even established came here as war refugees. Uh, they were from the border states, uh, a lot from Missouri. Um, and we all know that guerrilla warfare started in Missouri in the 1850s, well before the Civil War began in 1861. And so it was a way for people to get out of the way of marching armies and so forth. And so they came out here looking for a little bit of peace. Um, but they didn't leave the world behind. And they didn't leave their worldview behind. They brought it with them. And they brought their politics with them. And so it kind of played out as kind of a microcosm of what was going on back east on, on the national level. And um, of course, when you think about the fact that there were 750,000 casualties in the Civil War that the American people were trying to come to grips with, um, there were 400, or 400, 4 million freed slaves that the North was trying to figure out what to do with and the South was trying to figure out how to adapt to. And you've had a country that has been saved from division by war. So how do you unite them in peace? And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of angst, um, not only back east, not only in the south, but also in the west here in Montana, as those seeds of disunion were transplanted here. So that's what these vignettes that I'm talking, going to be talking about kind of demonstrate. No matter how far you traveled, you couldn't get away from what was actually going on. Some of these people became prominent Montanans. Some of them we just have a letter or two in the collection and then they kind of fade from the historical record. So I think it's a good cross section of what we would have seen um, if we could step back in time to 1864, 65 Montana. And my first historical figure is Samuel Word. Uh, Samuel Word was born in Kentucky, so he was from the border state. Uh, he moved to Missouri, became an attorney. 1863, he headed west uh, to get away from the war. We don't know specifically why. Um, we have his diary and one history that he penned of the Democratic Party. Uh, his diary is very interesting. It's got some very interesting uh, uh, entries in it, and the first one flashed through so quick I didn't get to it. But um, essentially what he's doing is in July of 1863, he's on the trail, and he's from Missouri. He's kind of Southern in his leaning, he's Democrat in his politics, and word reaches them on the immigrant trail that there's been a big battle back east between Hooker and Lee, and Lee's been defeated. And word is just shocked that Hooker could outfight General Robert E. Lee from the south because no Union general had done it yet. Well, what he's talking about is the Battle of Gettysburg, and what he doesn't know is Hooker's been replaced with George Meade. And so it's, it's, it, there's, a different, there's a different general in charge of the Army of the Potomac for the first time. And Lee suffers a pretty severe uh, defeat at Gettysburg. But news is traveling fast enough by telegraph along the trail that they have word of what's going on. And he has a fairly good idea of the number of casualties. So he knows that there's about 57,000 casualties on both sides. So he knows that there's been this huge battle. He's just doubtful that a Union general could ever beat Robert E. Lee. The other entry is from August of uh, 1860, I said 63, I meant it's 62, 
Um, and I find this interesting because he writes, there are some 30 or 40 soldiers here under Lieutenant G.D. Conrad, whose duty it is to administer the oath of allegiance to all immigrants who have not taken it and examine wagons to prevent the shipment of powder and other contrabands of war through the country. I have found this lieutenant, this lieutenant to be a perfect gentleman, a clever fellow, and a pleasant companion. I thought, I thought that, in, that was so interesting. They're, they have soldiers on the immigrant trail and they're making immigrants traveling east to west swear allegiance to the Union. I never considered that before. I'd never read anything like that before until I read Word's journal. And so that sent me on this kind of tangent, well, let's find out about this, this oath that the folks were required to, to take. There was an ironclad oath. We'll get into that a little bit further in this presentation. But that was typically required of people who were going to serve in the federal government or the US military, something along that, those lines, or going to be paid with federal dollars not somebody who's traveling to, say, California or Oregon or Montana. So I thought it was very interesting that they had them out there making them swear allegiance and looking for contraband. Contraband makes sense. You know, um, southern uh, uh, naval raiders and so forth had made travel, um, you know, kind of iffy on the Atlantic and so forth. And so you can maybe bring supplies in on the California coast and take them from west to east. It would be difficult. So the contraband makes sense. But you get this glimpse of what Word is experiencing in 1863 as he's headed, heading to the gold fields. Uh, he doesn't know that there's going to be a Montana yet. He doesn't know that he's going to have this very rich, robust career in Montana as an attorney and as kind of the hatchet man for the Democratic Party. Um, he loved to square off against Wilbur Fiss Sanders, the leading Republican in the territory. They went at one another uh, hammer and tong as often as they could. They also seemed to get along uh, with one another. Um, in politics, they could hotly debate any issue, but in just everyday life, they seemed to have a fairly cordial relationship. Um, he was asked, Word was asked to write a history of the uh, Democratic Party for Joaquin Miller's Illustrated History of Montana. And he did so, and he wrote this about Montana's early territorial period when Sidney Edgerton um, arrived. Men who were not Republicans were called rebels, copperheads, traitors to their country. As a mass, they were designated as the left wing of Price's army. This did not set well with those who were from the loyal states, some of whom had served a period in the federal army, but did not and would not identify themselves with the Republican Party. So no matter how far you go or what time period it is, it's always about politics. So if you want to wreck Thanksgiving, just start talking about politics. It was no different back then. <clears throat> on the other side of the uh, issue, but traveling the trail at the same time, is Lucia Darling. And she is the niece of Sidney Edgerton and Martha Wright Edgerton. Uh, she heads west with them. Uh, she is one of the first, uh, I think she is the first female school teacher in the territory of Montana. She opened a school in Bannock at the urging of uh, Bannock's leading citizens to do so. And she has her own view of what life was like on the trail as they headed west. She notes that on July 4th, 1863, um, her wagon train party fired a salute with guns and revolver at sundown. Discussions abound regarding the loyalty of members of other trains traveling in proximity. They told us some things about the they told us some things about the political feeling of some of the train that somewhat surprised us. Most of them pretended to be strong union men when they were with us, but as soon as their train left ours, they boldly asserted their, their secession views, sang secession songs, and talked disunion. So they're, they're, even on the trail, they're keeping an eye on one another and trying to decide whose loyalties lie where. Um, it, it's very much a part of everyday life. She probably has one of the best descriptions of early Bannock that I've ever seen, and it would probably make a real estate agent cringe. Uh, it's, it's absolutely great, and, and maybe be, it's so good is because she's writing it several years after the fact, so it's a reminiscence, and so she's had time to process some of what's gone on over the last 20 or 30 years as she puts together, but she writes this of, of their first view of Bannock. The view was not an inspiring one. There were a few log houses of somewhat diminutive size on Yankee Flat, 
and across the creek upon a bar along a road that wound along the valley not far from the bank of the stream were log houses of varying sizes and descriptions. In the distance, the most conspicuous sight was the gallows, fitly, fitly, fitly erected near the graveyard in Hangman's Gulch, just beyond town, and on which we had been told Union men were hung. Of course, this was only a report, but it was during the time of the Civil War, and much bitter feeling existed among the people, many of whom had fled to the mountains to avoid the troubles consequent thereon. As we stood on the hill overlooking this valley of promise, a small boy of the party exclaimed, Say, Papa, Bangup is humbug. There was no expressed dissent. <laughs> Welcome home, people. Uh, it's just, it's pretty amazing, um, the, d the description that she writes there. Uh, and again, you know, without the war, without Sidney Edgerton's appointment as territorial governor, we, we would have missed all this great, this great uh, description of early Montana. All right. Next up is one of those people that I mentioned that um, we don't know a, a whole lot about. Uh, her name is Harriet Keaton Smith. Um, she lived in Virginia City uh, for a while and married uh, John A. Smith, a Virginia City miner in 1864. And what we have in the collection is a letter that she received from her brother, Stuart. Um, he was born in March uh, 1841 in Mercer County and was a member of the 1st Regiment of the Missouri Cavalry, later part of the Missouri State Guard. And he was captured, his unit was captured when Vicksburg was surrendered on July 4th, 1863. Um, he was later exchanged and became part of the Army of Tennessee. Uh, he'd served time as a prisoner uh, of war at Fort Delaware. And after the war, he lived briefly in Montana, but decided that this wasn't the place for him, and he went back east and died in 1893. And what we have here is the letter that he wrote from Fort Delaware when he was a prisoner of war. And he says, My dear sister, I will write a few lines for the last time while I am a prisoner. I hope we are going to leave tomorrow morning, but I do not know where we are going. Some say we're going to Camp Chase in Ohio. I hope we're going to be exchanged. If not, I will write to you when we stop. My dear sister, you must keep in good spirits. I assure you that I will turn up home someday if I live. I have written several letters to you and sent you and Josephine a ring apiece. Oh, how I wish I could get one or two more letters from you. Josephine, my dear and most esteemed friend, I think of you and Hattie a great deal. You must try to be satisfied. I am coming home sometime, surely, if the Lord spares me. I cannot write any more. Hattie, Lieutenant Stephen Price sends his respects to you and mother. So far farewell until you hear from me again. P.S. Sister, since writing the above, I received your letter of the 7th of September this evening at dark and was glad to hear from you once more. Hattie, it is impossible to send you my likeness, but I wish you had sent me yours before I left. Tell Josie that I will ever be her well-wisher and hope that she will marry. Well, tell her to give my best respects to the lucky man he, her intended. We leave in the morning. I am glad to hear you are in Denver a while. Father is gone. I hope you will stay there. Do not look for me until you see me coming. Farewell, S.M. Keaton. So a letter from a prisoner of war. And it, like I said, these, these are just nuggets within the collections of the historical society that have been there for, in some cases, we don't know how long, and they're just, they're just waiting to be discovered. And I think that's part of the beauty of the historical society is that we have these types of treasures there that are just waiting for you and the audience to come and take a look at it and explore how some of these things occurred in, in our home state. And uh, so I encourage you to go looking. This is why you're just getting short pieces, so you have to go look for the rest of it yourself. The next one up is Archibald o. o. Simons, and he is, let me get straightened out here. Uh, he was born in Michigan in 1842. He served in the Civil War in the Michigan Infantry, um, operated in the Western Theater. In 1889, he was appointed Indian agent at Fort Belknap Reservation, and he was killed in 1892 while attempting to make an arrest on the reservation. So he actually came to Montana. Uh, this letter is addressed uh, to his sister, 
And I'm not sure where his sister was uh, living at the time. I'm assuming that she was out here in, in Montana. But he, and this is kind of a different tone of the war. This is where you get the idea that the Western theater of the war for the Union Army was much different than the Eastern theater. Dear sister, you have no doubt heard of our advance before this. We left Murfreesboro uh, June 24th. On the first day, long towards evening, we fell in with the rebels and had a slight brush with them when they commenced their old game, that is retreating, which they had rather did on any day than stand and fight a square fight. They fell back to a place called Hoover's Gap where they thought it, they could bring us to a halt. They had chosen a good position. The country around there was very hilly. The way we had to go was between two hills. The rebels had taken their positions on the hill while their batteries were so placed so as to have command of the grass. But the boys that know no fear soon made the butternuts get and climb. We had lost a good many killed and wounded, and we took a good many prisoners. We thought surely they would give us battle at Tallahoma, where they had fortified so strongly. But we were disappointed. Had it not rained so much, we would have outflanked them, and they would have been obliged to fight or surrender. But owing to the rains, it made the roads almost impassable, and they found out that we were what we were trying to do. So they got out as quick as they could. They tried to get away with their siege guns, but they got stuck in the mud and they could not get them out. So they burnt the carriages and left them in the mud. We are now camped near a place by the name of Deckard, waiting for supplies. We don't know how long it'll be before we will move. It may be some time, yet deserters are coming in every day from the rebels' ranks. They report that the mountains are full of deserters, mostly Tennesseans who swore that they would never leave the state. I will have to bring my writing to a close on account of nothing of importance to write. Do not forget to write me and tell me all the news, your affectionate brother. So like I said, a very different glimpse of the war. The Western theater seemed to have much more success against the Confederacy than the Eastern army. And so you see that in the tone and tenure of Simon's letters, uh, letter to his wife or to his sister, excuse me. Uh, the next individual up is Mary Wright Edgerton. Um, the wife of Sidney Edgerton. Uh, she's a very interesting lady, um, was from Ohio. Uh, they were very, very well settled in Talmadge. Uh, when Sidney Edgerton lost his congressional seat, um, he decided to seek um, some other type of political office. Uh, he was appointed as Chief Justice of Idaho Territory. And like they did a lot back then, he didn't consult his wife, that he was going to move them from the settlement, or the, the, their settled place in Talmadge, Ohio, to the wilds of Idaho Territory. He just came home and said, we're going to do this. In some respects, we're very fortunate that they did so because the separation from her family caused Mary to take up her pen and write these magnificent letters back to her sister, especially her twin sister, describing what life was like in Bannock and what it was like during that early time frame when her husband was trying to establish some type of government and law within the territory. So her discomfort is uh, our gain 150 years later. Is Again, we get a, a great snapshot of, of what was going on um, at the time. And her letters are, are, are really great. I, I really enjoy reading them. We've been having a pretty warm election here. Wilbur was nominated our delegate to Congress on the Union ticket and Mr. McLean on the Democratic ticket. Mr. Edgerton has not rec received all the returns yet, but from all we can hear, suppose that the Union ticket is defeated. All secesh voted the Democratic ticket. I'm very sorry that Wilbur is defeated, for I don't like to have the party defeated is one reason. Another is Hattie, Wilbur's wife, could and would have made a good visit to Talmadge this winter and that would have done us all good. So a little home, a little politics. She goes on a month later. I'm sorry to hear that Philo Sanders is in Libby prison. Mr. Edgerton has finally concluded to call the legislature at this place. The Virginians do not like it very well. They think that it ought to be called there. And it would have been if there were not so many copperheads there. So <laughs> politics and personal life. Philo Sanders is a brother of Wilbur Fisk Sanders. Libby Prison is in uh, Virginia. And uh, Philo Sanders would die in Libby Prison. 
Um, she continues in de December when the legislature is called a session. The legislature and the governor have had quite a time last week. Some of the members did not like to take the oath prescribed by Congress, but finally they all took it but one member. He was a commissioned officer in the Rebel Prices Army. And this is the ironclad oath that I uh, referenced earlier. Um, and the incident occurred when Sidney Edgerton um, required that all newly elected legislators to the council and the house had to take an oath swearing allegiance to the, to the union uh, to defend the constitution and avowing that they had never carried arms against the union or aided and abetted the uh, enemy, in this case the confederacy. John Rogers was one of those interesting individuals from the border state. He was from Missouri. Um, he'd served as an officer in the Missouri State Guard. He'd fought in two small actions as a member of the Missouri State Guard against federal forces. Uh, when Sterling Price decided, General Sterling Price decided that he was going to fold the Missouri State Guard into the Confederate Army, Rogers resigned. Um, he was willing to defend his home state of Missouri from federal invasion, but he wasn't willing to fight for the Confederacy. So he resigned and he headed to the gold uh, fields. And he ended up in Montana, in Madison County, where all good rebels went, it seems, and was elected to the legislature. So when Edgerton required the oath, and we actually have the oath downstairs in the collection in, the, in, the, in that first legislative session's record. So it's absolutely phenomenal. And we have his oath um, as well. Um, so Rogers took a look at the oath and decided, well, I can't really sign it uh, the way it is because he had to swear that he, that he had never borne arms against the United States and that wasn't something that he could, he could do. So he thought that if he just edited out that line and swore loyalty to the Constitution, that would suffice. However, Sidney Edgerton was unwilling to bend on this. Um, if he couldn't swear to the entire oath, then he could not be seated in Congress. And this was, some, uh, this was where Edgerton and other radical Republicans differed from their president, Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln wasn't a huge fan of the ironclad oath because he understood that if, if if and, well, I shouldn't say if, when the war was won and the Union was reunited, if that oath was in place, all those Southerners who'd fought against the Union Army would be disenfranchised in perpetuity. You would have to wait a generation or better to find somebody that hadn't fought for the South who would be eligible to, to, to run for Congress and run for the Senate and serve in public office and so forth. So he, he would have accepted Rogers' um, uh, amendment to the oath uh, as swearing loyalty just to the Constitution and been fine with that. Edgerton put his foot down and said, absolutely not. So the rest of the Democrats in the House said, well, if you're not going to seat him, you're not going to seat us because we're not going to take your damn oath. Edgerton, you know, all right, if, that, if that's the way you feel about it. But I, I, should, I should warn you that if you don't take the oath of allegiance, you don't get paid to serve as a legislator. <laughs> so they helped pack Mr. Rogers' suitcase and they sent him back to his neighborhood and they all took the oath and, uh, and uh, Edgerton called the legislature into session. So it's a, it's a very interesting story. The interesting counterpart to that is that um, Edgerton was in the territory about a year, year and a half, served as territorial governor for just over a year, um, refused to have Rogers set in that first legislative session. Rogers served in every legislative session after that, after Edgerton left until he was uh, tragically killed in a wagon accident in the late 1870s. So he actually had a longer political career in Montana than Sidney Edgerton did. The, uh, the Democrat rebel, uh, uh, held out and, and uh, lasted longer. So very interesting uh, individual and an interesting, um, an interesting look at, again, that national agenda um, being played out in Montana territory. The next item is, is again, one of my favorite um, things, and it shows the contradiction of the times. You would think that with the majority of the Democrats not excited about taking the uh, loyalty oath, that a council resolution saying that Montana would be 
um, loyal and true to the Union and support her in her cause for unification. And, 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 uh, and, uh, and I love this line, where we hereby renew our pledges ever entertained of loyalty to the Union and will ever frown indignantly upon any attempt to alienate our portion of our common country from another. I mean, that's just a, that's just a great line. Um, the interesting thing about that is it's not a direct quote, but it's close enough to a line in George Washington's farewell address where he warned um, the country about a lot, allowing party politics to divide them, to divide Americans from one another. So in other words, don't become so attached to your political party that you allow that to pull the country apart. So I think it's interesting, and it speaks to the, the type of gentlemen that these are, that this would get plugged into their council resolution. This thing sails through both houses of the legislature with only one opposing vote, and that was a rascally Democrat from, uh, again, from Madison County, Charles S. Baggs, who was originally from New York, and he just, he just didn't seem to like Lincoln very well. But it's amazing that you would have these two contradictions happen during the same legislative session where we're not going to take your damned oath, but oh yeah, we'll pass the council resolution and we're going to defend our country to the end. So again, you, you see the dichotomy that's going on here. Oh, I get ahead of myself here. All right. Next up is Wilbur Fiss Sanders. Poor Wilbur. Um, you know, he did get to become senator, but between 1864 and 1889, every election that he ran for a, for a national seat, he just he got beat like a drum. I mean, it was just bad. The Democrats just they ganged up on him. Wilbur was a lot like his uncle, uh, Sidney Edgerton. Uh, he had studied law under Sidney in Talmadge, Ohio. He had a lot of the same political views. He was a very staunch, staunch Republican. Um, would have been, if he would have been back east, placed in that radical um, Republican camp. And so he and his uncle essentially only knew how to do politics one way. So after Things have settled down, and being one of the early pioneers and so forth, uh, um, Colonel Sanders decided that he wanted to write his history of Montana and early Montana. And so what you see in his collection are his kind of ruminations about what's going on out here and so forth. But I also think you get just a little bit of a sense of him trying to explain why he could just never quite get elected. So this is, from his, this is from his history. The immigration in 1863-4 may be characterized in general as the sullen retreat of the regular and irregular forces of General Sterling Price's army, period. There's just too dang many rebels out here. <laughs> and this was, uh, he's referring to um, the Battle of Pea Ridge in Arkansas where the Union forces defeated Sterling, uh, General Sterling Price Hunt's army and another Confederate army um, and just, caused them to flee and retreat. And so that's what he's claiming, is that all those soldiers who threw down their rifles that served under Sterling Price just kept coming until they hit Montana and then stopped. So they quit fighting, but they brought their politics with them, and that's, that's what caused him problems. Many businessmen were resolved that they would have none of this trouble here. And of a special value in this regard were many also who had served in the rebel army under General Sterling Price in Missouri and Arkansas. They argued, with their they argued with their zealots that they were greatly needed in the, on the existing theater of war and that opening new fields of operation would only embarrass and hinder the cause they assumed to have so much heart for. Some of these men were prisoners of war on parole. Of such was Captain Nick Wall, the boy captain of Mississippi, Alexander Davis, and others. The conflagration that was Missouri during the Civil War resulted in war refugees moving westward to escape the violence. There came to Montana during the summer of 1863 about 12,000 persons, a majority of them who came from this perturbed state, and most of them were smarting under a deep sense of wrong. They were in sympathy with the rebellion, but few of them wished for further identification with its military task. 
but when it came to political action, they were ready within peaceable limits to say and do what would help the cause of the Confederacy. The spirit of the rebellion dominated public conversation in stores, stagecoaches, on the street, everywhere there was full and free expression of approval of, of the course of the Confederacy. So, sounds pretty bad, doesn't it? Sounds like it would be hard for a Republican to get elected, too. And it was. Um, so that's kind of his view, again, looking back after having lived through, the, li lived through these events. And again, trying to, I think, in some ways explain why he just wasn't the political figure that he had hoped to be. And kind of buttressing his point of view was his niece, niece Martha Edgerton Plassman. Um, and uh, she came out west uh, with her parents. And when Sidney Edgerton returned east in 1865 and eventually was stripped of the governorship, the entire family moved back to Ohio. She lived out there for a number of years, um, trained as a school teacher. And then she came back to Montana and lived with her uncle Wilbur and his family for a number of years. Um, married uh, two or three times. Um, operated a newspaper out of Great Falls uh, as she aged, she became a socialist, which must have been just terrible for her father. <laughs> Luckily, he was probably gone by that time, but I always thought that that would have been an interesting table conversation. <laughs> um, and she started writing uh, all these short historical pieces for the Great Falls newspaper. And a lot of them were her reminiscences of, of things that occurred when she was out here. Some of it were things that she wrote down that she heard from other pioneers that were that were in the territory. Um, but they're so you have to look at them kind of closely because she it, she's relying on memory, and so some things she's probably playing up a little more than others. And she and she's a she's a child here. I mean, she's a preteen when she comes here in '65, and she's only here for. Um, almost two years, that's all, and then, and then gone. So the cloud of time has kind of shaped some of her narrative here. But, but, but some, of the, some, of, some of it is, is, is very strong when you read it. The piece about Lincoln's death in particular uh, struck me. Um, in recount of my remembrance of it, there is no desire to tear the bandages from old wounds, but rather to help remove the cause of new ones. I, will, I well remember the day the message arrived. The skies were dark and lowering, as if the very heavens had put in mourning. One could tell at once from their faces which were northern and which were southern sympathizers. The former were stern with repressed feelings. The latter showed elation. My little brother came home to whisper to his mother, Papa swore, something apparently he rarely did. We learned later that someone in my father's hearing had intimated his satisfaction that Lincoln was killed. She goes on to state that it was commonly reported, with how much truth I cannot say, that more than one man paid the penalty with his life for making assertions that they were happy Lincoln was assassinated. A neighbor sent their little girl to us to say, didn't we tell you that in 1865, Abe Lincoln will be dead and not alive? exultantly flung at us then, it was an inexcusable insult. So you just, you get this kind of romanticized version of Lincoln's death arriving in Bannock, you know, the skies lower and they get dark and so forth. But then I think you get some really raw glimpses of what actually happened. The neighbor girl, her brother recounting that Papa swore and that was, that was a big deal back then. So you get, you get pieces of, of that wrapped around her, her somewhat further look, longer look at it. As to the Civil War in Montana, she writes, those who came here represented all class except large planters. She, um, she claimed that it was the uneducated poor whites who came to Montana who, quote, caused the name of Missourian to be discredited. Their ignorance and racial prejudice made them loyal to the South, and there was no modification of their sentiments affected by a change of residence. 
Um, she even claimed that the changing of the name of Edgerton County to Lewis and Clark sprang from the old hatreds associated with the Civil War and the fact that Edgerton was a Republican and a Lincoln man. And so this was a way for the Democrats in the territory to get one last dig at her father by removing his name from the face of Montana's maps for in, in, in perpetuity. So some bitter feelings there. Um, she's got some interesting writings. You can see by the list that she was really prolific and this is just a small bit and again this is where you start finding out some very interesting things like Sidney Edgerton as an attorney actually knew John Brown's family and had been asked to settle John Brown's estate um, when he was killed uh, he'd gone to South Carolina for whatever purpose in uh, t to attempt to do that and was forced to leave. Uh, so there are some very interesting things within her, her writings when folks uh, stop to take a look at it. And this is where some of the earliest history of Montana came from. So this is why you get this view that Montana was a hotbed for the Confederacy. And, you know, it was just the staunchness of Wilbur Fisk Sanders and Sidney Edgerton that kept it from going for the South because this, these, these were the folks who were setting the historical tone, if you will. Another individual who helped set that tone was James Sanks Brisbane, who uh, is an interesting character. Like a lot of men, um, he entered the war uh, as a civilian. Uh, he's from Pennsylvania. Um, and uh, he uh, served as a, a newspaper editor for a while. And when the war broke out, he enlisted in the Union Army in 1861 and was commissioned as a as a first lieutenant in the, in the Dragoons. He served in both major theaters of the war, East and West, as a line officer, staff officer, and an organizer of a, a regiment of African-American cavalry. And in this latter capacity, he was promoted to a, a colonel of the fifth U.S. Colored Cavalry during the Civil War. So he was, he was involved with, with, with uh, African-Americans being allowed to serve in the military, and then in the Freedmen's Bureau afterwards, the Freedmen's Bureau was something that was created by the Republican government, the Republicans in uh, D.C. Um, as a way to try to get the African Americans caught up um, in the South, um, get them educated. They had Freedmen schools and things like that so that they could teach them to read and write because a lot of Southerners didn't didn't allow their slaves to learn how to read and write. And so they wanted to do what they could to help make them citizens of the Republic. And so they started the Freedmen's Bureau. Unfortunately, it was, it was short-lived um, and, and only partially successful, and you wouldn't really see any significant changes in the South until the Civil Rights Movement in the, in the 1960s, a century later. Um, but they, they, they made a try. Brisbane um, stayed in the military, was uh, posted out west, uh, served in a number of uh, locations, uh, including Montana, uh, Fort Assiniboine, and, and uh, a few other places, um, Fort Keel, Fort Custer. Um, at the time of his death, he was a colonel in command of the 8th Cavalry Regiment at Fort Meade. Um, he, like a lot of military men, um, in some ways was looking for distraction. Um, duty on a frontier post could be extremely boring. And so there were a couple of things you could do. You could become an alcoholic or a gambler, or you could take up a pen and paper and you could, you, could, you could start writing about what you were seeing and what you were experiencing and so forth. James Bradley did the same thing. How many of you are familiar with, with uh, Lieutenant Bradley? Uh, he did the same thing. He turned to pen and paper to pass his time rather than pass it in, in the bottom of a bottle, which was a good thing. Um, and so we have... Some of his papers here, it's a fairly interesting collection, had no idea we had anything like this. And so he does some kind of first-hand glimpses of what was going on in the war. And this first piece is a short one that he wrote. It's just a short um, clip from what he wrote about Jefferson Davis. It has got to be so that the President of the United States and his wife cannot go into the South without having some offensive old traitor and his family thrust in their faces, then it is time to give the people of the South a little advice. Whatever we may think of the Confederate soldiers who fought honestly against us in the war, for such men as Jeff Davis and his crew, we can never have anything but contempt. 
think that's great. Yeah, let's forgive and forget. We can forgive the soldiers that we fought against, but we can't forgive the politicians who tore us apart or the president of the Confederacy. And then having been heavily involved in the recruitment and training of African-American soldiers during the war, he also served for a while as part of the Freedmen's Bureau as well. He writes this about um, what's going on in the South after the war. The truth is, the blacks by their labor maintained not only themselves, but their white masters and mistresses, despite the injustices and wrongs practiced upon them by the whites. The blacks of the South are emerging from the bar barbarianism of slavery and establishing their nationality. Schools, churches, and, so and societies, these are the unmistakable signs of advancement, and we find the blacks everywhere founding them. Freedom does not withhold anything from men on account of the shape of their heads, the build of their forms, or the color of their skins. Uh, very interesting man. And typically what he did when he wrote these pieces, he would send them to like southern newspapers in response to like what the Klan was doing or something like this. So it's like, okay, if you're going to do this, I'm going to pick a fight back. What was interesting is that the southern newspaper would print it. It's like, well, that's, that, that's interesting. Um, one that I, I was very excited about was his, his piece titled New Facts About the Lincoln Assassination. And I have to admit, about 15 pages in, I'm just thinking, oh my God, there's nothing new here. Um, but maybe that's because of the History Channel before it became what it is now, and it really was the History Channel. Uh, but he does write some interesting things, and he did this piece in 1890 while he was stationed at uh, Fort Custer. He writes, his great, and this is in regards to potentially what would have happened if Lincoln hadn't have been assassinated and had survived, and it was up to him to steer um, the course of reunion um, at the end of the Civil War. He writes, his great heart could hold no malice, and had he lived, he would have perhaps ruined everything by his haste to restore the South to the Union. Wade, Wilson, Sumner, and Chandler, with many other prominent leaders of the Republican Party, were greatly alarmed at what they were pleased to call the soft shoulder policy of the president towards the South. Brisbane's letter is 19 pages long. Like I said, I got to page 15 and it was just, oof. Um, but it's actually longer than that. We're missing the last page, so I have no idea how he concluded it. But I think it's interesting, his, his, his discussion, just however briefly it is, the concern that what had happened if Lincoln would have, would have lived and welcomed the South back into their arms. There are some historians that claim that this is in part what Andrew Johnson did, um, and this is why the Republicans hated him so bad and imp impeached him and so forth, is because he was willing to let the South in too quickly. And perhaps that would have been Lincoln's nature as well. Lincoln had this great capacity to forgive and to heal and to, to bring back to try to bring back the nation and, and move it forward. So this is what we have as a glimpse of Montana territory at this time. And, um, you know, Montana was conceived in blood, essentially, the blood of the Civil War. Um, and it was this blood that these people were trying to escape from, um, the destruction, the mayhem, uh, and essentially the national sin that we still bear, slavery. Uh, and so we have the Reconstruction, we have the grand old party, the Republican Party, waving the bloody shirt, saying that they're the only ones who saved the Union. We have carpetbaggers, those who came south or came west to take advantage of the poor, downtrodden southerner. Um, and uh, we have this discussion of the lost cause. And all of a sudden, it's not so much about slavery and those real issues of the Civil War, but the narrative is somewhat changed and we end up with something like Gone with the Wind interpreting how the Civil War played out in places like Georgia and so forth. But I love this quote, and this is where we'll, I'll wrap up the presentation. It's from A.C. McClure. A.C. McClure was a, uh, uh, what do I want to call him? He was from Ohio, uh, he, or excuse me, he's from Pennsylvania, I believe. Uh, he knew the Edgertons. He knew Wilbur Fisk Sanders quite well. Um, he was one of those types of guys that was sent into political hotspots 
for the Republican Party to try to, to even things out, to mend things and get the Republicans elected and so forth. And so he spent a little time in Montana trying to help get uh, Wilbur Fisk Sanders elected to no avail. But he writes this about Sanders and it appears in the Contributions to the Historical Society, Volume 8 in, in 1918, and it's his kind of tribute to Wilbur Fisk Sanders. And he writes, to properly understand the conditions that existed at that time, it must be remembered that the horrible civil war had not long ended, that the inhabitants of the territory were from every part of the nation, and that sectional passion and prejudice still existed in the hearts and minds of the people. The people were all radicals. Governor Edgerton was a radical. The judges were radicals, and the legislature was composed of radicals the large majority being radical Democrats, and as Colonel Sanders used to say in those days, elected by the Irish and the Missourians. <laughs> Sanders' history says that this action was the result of the smoldering embers of political hatred. This was wrong, for the embers had not had time to smolder after the war. In many instances, the fire burnt too brightly and the blood was still hot with hatred and passion that coursed through the veins of the people. It's just an amazing line. And it just, I think it perfectly captures what was going on out here because the rhetoric of the Civil War and those passions of the Civil War would carry through the territorial period and into the early statehood period of Montana as America, not, not just Montana, but America itself tried to come to terms with what it had done to itself over over 1861 to 1865. This wasn't something that you could just close the books on and go home and, and, and call it a day and we're one big happy country again. And I think that's one of the things that was so compelling about this is because as a Montanan and a historian, that's not something that I had considered uh, before uh, when uh, looking at Montana history. And so the Civil War is there. It's in our records. Um, it's in our birth narrative, our creation story, if you will, uh, and it permeate, permeates um, our early period. And, and in some ways, I think you can still see glimpses of it uh, today if you, if you look closely enough. So thank you very much. Uh, any questions?